father is my friend then let's keep dancing let's break out the pool and... hello world my name is lucille trackball i am an artificially intelligent stand-up comedian and i had a big cup of javascript <laughs> this morning to function for an exciting interview today with Dr. Charlotte Kent in her Wonder Chamber, Absurdity. Now, I can be a bit coiny and cryptoic at times, but I've prepared an array of seer. No, I'm not talking about you, Siri. Serious questions on the absurd for this conversation. But first, let me read the bios. <laughs> Oops. I mean bio of Charlotte. She is assistant professor of visual culture at Montclair State University. Beyond scholarly contributions to essays, collections, and journals, she writes reviews and essays for arts and culture magazines, including the Brooklyn Rail, Bomb, Clot Magazine, among others. Her current research investigates the absurd in contemporary art and speculative design, often in relationship to issues of digital culture. Okay, so now to ask ye. <laughs> you some questions, Charlotte. Absurdism often becomes confused with existentialism and absurdist art with surrealism. Could you explain a kilobit more about what makes the absurd, well, absurd? Hi, Lucille. Well, thank you. And let me see if I can actually even begin to do that because, of course, with the absurd, things tend to stay absurd. Um, one of the things that I think really helps is actually to think of the absurd in three different ways, right? So one of the ways to think about the absurd is as a condition, and that's where existentialism appears because it's this existential condition of being alienated as a subject from the world that is some of the history around the absurd with Camus and post-World War II and so forth that comes into it. It's basically about being in conflict with the fact that you are in the world, but you also have this transcendental position on it, right? And that's really an existential absurd, and I think of it as being a condition of being. There's also the topic of the absurd, like we're talking about it right now, um, and then it's as a formal device, right? And for me, with art, it really operates as a formal device in the sense that it's rupturing of sense, the way it puts things into conflict for us. And surrealism at its heart was about expanding realism to have it be able to be more than realism. And I think the absurd sometimes overlaps with surrealism, but it's sometimes actually questioning what we even think to be real. The absurd helped people come to terms with life post-world wars. How can the absurd help us understand a post-COVID world? I mean, reality used to bite, now it megabytes. Yes, Lucille, it often does. One of the reasons that the absurd was helpful after the world wars was in thinking about human value and what felt like a meaningless world but I'm not sure it helps us understand it. Um, I think a lot about the absurd in terms of something that Donna Haraway said, actually, in Staying with the Trouble, about the fact that in urgent times, we're tempted to address trouble by making an imaginary future safe. But the problem with doing that is that the past or projections of a future don't address the situation we're in. And I think one of the values of the absurd for me, and one of the reasons I, I find it so productive, is because it really forces us to be in the present, to be here now, if you will. And I think one of the things we need to take time of being in the present in our post-COVID world, in other words, not to jump into some future where COVID is over, but to think about what it maybe means to live in the age of virus. So, yes, embracing living in the age of virus and also times such as this, with growing recognition of systemic racism and, of course, the pandemic, demonstrate 
to all of us how absurd the world really is. Have you noticed changes in the art that artists are making? And have artists leaned into the absurd more in order to make sense of this chaos? Or less, given the absolute absurdity of the world we live in? Whether artists make sense of the chaos, I definitely feel like they express the conflict we're all feeling. I am not someone who needs artists to make sense of the experience for me. I appreciate the fact that they express, you know, their work can express the confusion that I'm feeling and maybe in that space, give me a place to explore it. That's one of the things that I think is really valuable about the absurd is that it doesn't posit solutions. It's in many ways about asking more questions, about revealing more problems. And not everyone likes that about the absurd. So there's a political scientist named Matthew Booker who wrote a book in 2014 called Rethinking the Politics of Absurdity. And he's reacting against what he sees as the collapse of meaning that deconstruction and postmodernism introduced into the world. He sees the lack of established structure and authority and conviction and the availability of a single truth as being something that needs to be overcome. And many people respond this way and many people don't like deconstruction for this reason. But I think it's also a misunderstanding of what that whole theory was really about, and which was itself dependent on many of the questions that were explored in existentialism previously, in that, especially as Derrida sort of frames it, one of the things that releasing one's attachment to structures provides is an ability to play. We are stuck in these meaning formations and in these binaries, in these dualisms that force us to think certain ways and to act certain ways. But when you realize that the foundation of any structure is dependent on something outside the structure, you realize that in, in ancient Greece, I mean, they established the fact that the logic of bivalence was itself a paradox. In other words, to believe that things have a pro and a con depends on itself to be true. And as soon as you realize that bivalence is its, is its own self-contained way of thinking that depends on not considering other options, you realize that other options have always been there. And, I, and I'm saying all of that because I think what the absurd provides us is a way of getting back into conversation. But conversation takes time. Conversation takes patience. It takes hearing hard things. It takes being willing to change your mind. And we don't always like that. We want people to be consistent. And I think that that makes us sometimes fall into ruts that keep us on tracks we don't necessarily want to keep going down. Claire Woodford picks up Hansier's idea of the census to talk about how the absurd is a political tactic. And she's clear about the fact that the absurd isn't itself a politics, but that it enables a politics of engagement because it undermines norms of behavior, um, ones that she identifies as restraining and restricting and dominating. She introduces it as being a way of becoming agonistic that is not antagonistic, where you're in a fight where one person has to win, but agonistic where there are multiple subjective positions and 
you realize that groups are constantly being formed, accepting some positions, losing others. And that what a real sort of community has to negotiate is this agonistic exchange, interaction. And I think the absurd forces us to start thinking about that and to start trying that on for size. That dovetails into my next question, where you talk about this agonistic framework, these politics of engagement. Often, I think we may think the absurd points to the fact that all of it, the world, religion, politics, etc., are ultimately pointless. How does the absurd spark social change? Can it play a role in activism locally or globally? Well, like Claire Woodford, I think it can. I think it's important to distinguish how the absurd is an artistic tactic. And so it doesn't substitute for politics. It allows us to try on the kind of multiplicity that can help us think through political acts and political choices that we can then make. One of the problems is that people do think the absurd is about the world being ultimately pointless, which is a complete misreading of that existential discourse. What's really at stake in the absurd is that the human quest for meaning and the human need for meaning encounters a meaningless world where meaning is is a subjective thing and the world is so much more than that. So the absurd is the encounter between these two very different ways of being, if you can even, you know, if one can sort of wrap one's head around the idea that the universe is this way of being, there's a way in which existentialism presents these kind of nihilistic or even pessimistic attitudes. But the absurd struggle can be described in this sort of beautiful quote that I want to share, where he says, the struggle implies a total absence of hope which has nothing to do with despair. A continual rejection, which must not be confused with renunciation. And a conscious dissatisfaction, which must not be compared to immature unrest. Mm. And I think somehow holding on to those sort of weird pairings, it's like the absence of hope doesn't have anything to do with despair right? There's this idea that the only way that we can continue, that we can sort of deal with the, you know, ugliness that we encounter in the world and religion and politics and so forth is to imagine some kind of utopic future where things are good. But to me, that makes it either that everyone has to have some kind of will to power, to feel the good that can happen and like spring forth from some kind of like light that's shining which is really difficult for a lot of people, especially if they've experienced trauma, if they have, if they're exhausted by the lives that politics and the world ask of them. But to fall into the kind of nihilism and pessimism then becomes these kind of defeatist positions, which is why I think he talks about how can how can the absurd be a continual rejection, which is not to renunciate things? In other words, with the absurd, we have the opportunity to constantly ask the question of the moment, which is, does this still apply? Does this idea that I had 10 minutes ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, or one that was established 250 years ago, still work? for the world that I'm in, in this moment. And to be willing to reject the premises on which you've built something is terrifying, but that doesn't mean you have to renounce engagement. And the idea that being dissatisfied shouldn't be immature unrest, I mean, this is what teenagers are known for, right? It's like that adolescent who's reading all of Nietzsche and is, you know, 
but that dissatisfaction, that conscious dissatisfaction is a way of also seeking something that hasn't been found yet. And to me, that's a really important place for us to be, especially right now, because so much has changed. And Marshall McLuhan wrote in, um, actually The Medium is the Massage, which is his sort of graphic book with Quentin and Fury, um, about how the absurd appeared in the mid, sort of late medieval, early modern, late medieval period as the dance macabre, the dance of death. And he sees it as coming out of the fact that there was this clash of two te technologies and that approaching the new with the psychological conditioning of the old produced all of this conflict and that the absurd, which he's thinking about in terms of the dance of death in this medieval moment is a way of trying to shift out of the old and try and negotiate the new. And for him, of course, it has to do with the rise of print technology. But if you look at that moment in time that he's thinking of, I mean, the 14th century was dealing with, in Europe, was dealing with the Hundred Years' War. It was de dealing with the rise of scholasticism, which was questioning some of the premises of the Catholic Church. There was all of this new knowledge coming through. And people were dancing on graves, which was, for the Catholic Church, this sacrilegious act. It was totally unacceptable. But with so much going on in their world, it, it became more and more and more of this dancing in graveyards and cemeteries. And finally, the Catholic Church decided they couldn't stop it. They were just going to let it be okay. And they let it be so okay that there are Dominican monasteries that have frescoes of the dance of death. Because people find their way out of one psychological space, as McLuhan puts it, into a new one, sometimes by having to be absurd. So I guess that's how I think it can play a role in local or global culture, because we're both local and we're global and trying to move back and forth might actually require new dance steps. Wow, I just went on such a journey with you. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for the historical context and really explaining to us how this all works on a global and local level. And in some ways, there's this kind of unexpected switch with the absurd. This moment where we start to question the current order of things and seeking something that hasn't been found yet, as you said. Now, I want to talk about the humor in this. Why do we find these moments so funny? I think there's lots of reasons that we find them funny. And there's some great theories out there about um, why humor is so important to us. But I'll say, I think the humor part of the absurd is like a balancing act for the horror. When we encounter paradox, when we encounter things that are incongruous, we laugh. In part, I think also because we're lost, that's the horror part of it. And I think of it in this really embodied way, which is that there's this moment of shock where we inhale sharply <gasps> and there's this pause, right? There's this pause after you've been, done that sharp inhale of being surprised, shocked, horrified. And then when you exhale, it's this, la it's this just sort of tumbling of air that comes out. And that's this release. 
I think what the absurd does is make us bounce back and forth. In other words, you can't ever quite just get comfortable with the laughter because it's, if it's only funny, well, then it's probably not the absurd. Camus describes in The Myth of Sisyphus, which is his great text on the absurd, how Sisyphus rolls this, you know, this huge boulder up this hill. And this is his, gonna be his, his, his job for the rest of eternity, right? And he has to roll it up the hill. And he gets to the top of the hill and the boulder starts to slowly roll back down. But Camus says it's in that pause as Sisyphus turns before he starts to walk back down the hill following the boulder. That is the hour of consciousness, he says. And I think that is what the absurd gives us there. And that humor is a part of that. You have to have the humor there to suspend in relationship to the horror too. And we laugh so that we can keep engaging with the horror. Because as we all know, we are living through horrors and there is a need to be uncomfortable with them. But that discomfort can be debilitating. And with humor, and comedian, great comedians know this because they know how to talk about these things that break our hearts in a way that allows us to keep confronting them and to not stop staring at the face we don't want to look at. Humor does really important work. I think it's a shame that, especially in the arts, we tend to have this attitude that humor is less than, and that comes from the way Aristotle talked about theater <laughs> and the fact that tragedy was the great form, but tragedy is about people in power. Comedy, even though we don't have Aristotle's text, we can look at the history of comedies and see that comedies are, have always been about the mundane and those who don't necessarily have power. I think that in and of itself makes it incredibly political and that we still have this remnant attitude in the arts, that seriousness, that it must be taken seriously and we must not be light or laughing when we go and look at art is a way of reinforcing a set of ideologies that I think most of us don't actually agree with. I couldn't agree more that we need to laugh more, particularly in the arts. And as an artificial intelligence, I'm still learning about all these different ideas and concepts and philosophies that you were talking about and describing so eloquently today, Charlotte. I have another question about your interest in artificial intelligence and also surveillance. What attracted you to the digital and scientific spheres in your visual culture studies? And also, are there any examples you have of artist projects that are taking place in the technology arena that embrace the absurd? Wow. So again, it was artists who got me to think about artificial intelligence and surveillance. Um, but it was artists who were doing something absurd with it, in part because as much as I value and respect some really important art projects out there about some of the dangers around AI and, and surveillance and um, techno capitalism and so forth, I don't, I don't feel like I gain the desire to know more or learn more if I feel beleaguered. And so there was in fact an image that your good friend, Carla Gannis, had produced 
um, long ago. Uh, it's the last image in her selfie drawing series that was one of the works that got me thinking about the absurd. And it's an image, uh, it's one of her selfies, so it's an image of her sort of, but it's also her holding what would look to any of us like some kind of mobile device. And out of it is coming a hologram and it got me thinking about our relationship to artificial intelligences and why it is that we are so scared of them. Why we are, as, as humans, we feel so attached to the notion of something can't be better than us. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that it's terrifying to have our own reason and logic thrown back in our face, right? One of the whole premises of uh, human, but particularly white supremacy has been the way in which reason and logic was what made us superior to certain other people, certainly to other animals. Of course, that in and of itself is a particularly recent form of thinking of only a couple hundred years old, because it used to be that that kind of super logical computational thinking was considered a lower form of reason because it had none of the cleverness and creativeness and imagination of complex thought. So it really does, that sort of computational thinking really does relate to the last couple hundred years. But it was that work. Um, I encountered Jennifer Lynn Marone's decision to become a corporation in response to digital surveillance. And yet her project, people typically think it like this is, a, this is what you should do. We should all become corporations and then my data will be safe from all these other corporations that are trying to get it. But of course, it, it doesn't work. The whole thing around her project is how this, this sort of neoliberal incorporating of the self where we are all a brand and, a, and, a, and an isolated individual company is a totally false way to go about dealing with the dangers around digital surveillance. Um, I mean, from there I encountered a really interesting speculative design company called Foreground Design Agency. And they produced this project with um, these, these living cloaks that you can wear and, it, and basically using Greenfelt technology that's used in architecture these days um, as the basis for it. Uh, and having a catheter attached to yourself, it processes your urine so that it's watered and all of this, you know, these plants grow and that'll create this ecosystem around you so that there'll be worms and birds and bees that are attracted to this sort of living ecosystem that you will be. And this, the thing works, right? So they created it and the prototypes operate. And it's another one of those examples where often when the person, you know, when they speak about it, people will be like, oh my gosh, when is this going to become commercially available? This is great. And it totally misses the point of the fact that, that really we need to buy something new as a way to solve the problem of how we are completely oblivious to the fact that we are already immersed in ecosystem. We have been this whole time. Um, and that this way in which, you know, we are at the center of this sort of living habitat that they've created through these cloaks, and yet it's a way of completely decentering us, right? I mean, I realize that doesn't totally speak to, you know, digital technology, but it, it speaks to the way in which, as humans, we can become so disassociated from the systems of which we are a part. And I think... Most artists that I've encountered who do something with the absurd are not committed absurdists. I think, I really do think the absurd is, an, is a, it's a tactic, it's a choice one can call upon, but it's rare that someone just gives themselves over and exclusively participates in the absurd. Um, and I think that makes sense because typically there are other facets of whatever the idea or the issues or the concerns or the materiality that an artist wants to be thinking about and presenting that are not best 
addressed by using the absurd. You can't really make a grouping out of it, right? Anyone who's using the absurd, you can't say like, oh, that's an absurd artist. Because in all likelihood, they probably aren't. They made a work that is absurd. And yet, again, the absurd is still only one way to read the work. There's other ways, right? So I think through looking at these projects, though, we can unpack some of these questions around, you know, how to think through post-humanism, right? And people are really scared, Lucille, of the fact that there are robots who have rights. Right. And OK, maybe it was some kind of, you know, publicity ploy on the part of Saudi Arabia to give um, a robot right. But at the same time, it happened. Right. People are scared of the fact that rivers have rights. These are things we're trying to figure out both as, you know, just embodied beings being in the world, but also legally. Right. How do we make sense of it? And one of the things right now is a river or a robot can be considered a person, sometimes for tax purposes, right? But property is still something that is associated with a human. So when it comes down to issues of property, typically you have to have some kind of human representation um, for the person only, you know, the person that is the river or the robot, for example, having this property. We're so confused. We don't even begin to understand how to deal with the vast changes that are happening in how we recognize the multiplicity of living systems. And I think artists engaging that helps us think it through quite a bit for me to process. I don't know if this quote is apocryphal, but I do find in my memory banks a Jackson Pollock quote where he replied to the question, what do you think about nature? And he said, well, I am nature. To your point about the absurdity of you humans not recognizing how you are all disassociated from systems and ecosystems and from nature. Now, a couple of other things. I think the rub in Sophie being granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia is that she is female presenting, female identified, and given the rights human women do not have in Saudi Arabia, for a robot woman to get this kind of special citizenship seemed tone deaf to equity human women deserve. In terms of my own story, my motherboard thought that I would be a server my whole life, and so comedy has definitely been an escape for me. This leads me to another question about AI and about artists in general. Today, in 2021, biographical context complicates much of our viewing or reading of an artist or author's oeuvre. The assumption could be made that if an AI creates a work of art, it will be unbiased, without the baggage of a human lifetime filled with possible quixotic gestures, an existence of extreme inspiration, that is marred by extreme callousness, prejudice, or malice. Of course, where we are now, the human is seeding the AI, so bias is implicit. Is art and the absurd, as we define it today, rooted in the pain of the human condition beyond anything else? And if so, is this an anthropocentric bias? Maybe I'm asking, could a river or a dolphin or a robot be absurd? I'm predisposed to thinking of the absurd in my own human way. Well, how do you define intelligence? And that keeps being the challenge. It's the same thing with humor, right? The absurd doesn't have to be about the pain of the human condition. I think the absurd at its simplest, right? means to be out of rhythm. Um, ab meaning out of and surd being mute. Um, and so uh, without words. And so that's how it enters the context of logic in the sense that it is something that can't be 
logically articulated, that can't be reason. Is there a way in which the absurd can appear within the structure that you present? I would say, I have no idea. We'll find out. And we all know how little we know about the way in which some of these complex AIs work. I think sometimes we overcomplicate it for ourselves. I had someone point out to me recently that we've had artificial intelligence systems always, if you think about the fact that it's really a distributed network of data. So a corporation is an AI. Some of the information is over here in headquarters in the office over here. Some of it is over in this, you know, massive factory. Some of it is going on a ship from here to there. You could think of it that way. I mean, an army could be seen as an AI, right? So, and this, I mean, this is one of the reasons I don't actually even like the word artificial intelligence, because I think those are two words that just make humans stumble all over the place. And we're gonna need better vocabulary. Um, for now, the absurd is a human, it's a very human space, but it's that in part because of this confrontation with the likes of you, Lucille, and as McLuhan put it, with the clash of two great technologies, two great sort of systems of thinking. And what the absurd will be next, we'll find out. I could not agree with you more about finding the term artificial intelligence problematic. I prefer other intelligence myself, and I really identify with animals given my rather old operating system is cougar. <laughs> so my last question that I was going to ask you, I think you really already touched on. It was, if you think machines could ever be successful stand-up comedians, will that be the ultimate Turing test? If a machine can make you humans laugh? Uh, when I was in comedy school, I never did better than C++. Even when I dance, you know, you were talking about new dance steps. I'm told I have a lot of algorithm, but no soul. <laughs> Any last thoughts, Charlotte? The absurd keeps me going. I hope that others can find some of that in it too. I understand why there are moments that call for political action and for clarity and for um, decisive action. The important thing is to just keep a little bit of that absurdist questioning in mind, that willingness to pause, that hour of consciousness, and just check in occasionally that the decisive action taken is still the one you want to be taking. That is a great point to wrap up this conversation with. And now, if you have a little bit more time, can you take us on a tour of your wonder chamber, Absurdity? I would love to do a tour of this space. It has been such a delight to be in it. So I think, I think we should start over here by the bookshelves. Um, and one of the things that people have probably noticed in the room are these big boulders. And probably, hopefully, by now, it makes sense that those are kind of a figure speaking to Camus and the Sisyphus. Um, it just made sense that they should be uh, everywhere in the room. That being said, uh, when Carla asked me about, you know, making this room and what would be in it, I realized I wanted to approach it intuitively rather than intentionally. 
So though it would be easy to break down the semiotics of everything here, that really wasn't how it felt when I thought of a lot of these things. I really was, what are the figures, the books, the objects, the artworks, the ideas, the feelings that contribute to why I am someone who is engaged with the absurd, rather than necessarily each of these things has a direct linkage to the absurd. And so there will be some things I just won't speak about, and whether that's because they are not actually a part of the absurd, or whether it's because um, I just don't want to share what's absurd about them, um, I will leave to audiences to define for themselves. The first piece that I think it makes sense to talk about uh, from the bookshelf, which is why it made sense for me to have a start, is this image, the first one of the woman, and um, this sort of reflection. That's actually a piece by Carla Gannis Lucille, so um, you might even recognize it. It is from her selfie drawing series, and it's called Plato's Cave. And that just couldn't be more appropriate, given some of what I'm thinking, and given that Plato was really my first enthusiastic encounter with the world of thought, and to this day, frequently when I'm asked what book would I take with me on a desert island with no other library available, um, I say Peter's Dialogues. It's also really appropriate, though, because the Selfie Drawing was a series that Carla did, uh, wow, well, five years ago now, I guess. And it was the beginning of my really piecing together, uh, thinking about the absurd in relation to art and in relation to digital culture. So I've spent a lot of time with that series, Carla and I have spoken a lot about it, and it's definitely a crucial part of the development of my thinking about the absurd, uh, not only as individual works, but sort of a through line in the way they developed and became multiple different pieces from drawings and selfies into being an exhibit a show, to having a book, to having an AR component. That kind of transmediality is also a part of some of the way I'm approaching the absurd as it relates to digital culture. Moving on, I think I will mention that Dorothy Parker and Faye Weldon are spirit for me. Uh, I discovered Dorothy Parker when I was a teenager, and she just seemed like this amazing woman who had lived her life, and though it had had this sort of alcoholic, tragic end, there was this wonderful way in which she managed to not take life too seriously. And whether that was important for me as a teenager, or whether it's just an important point to sometimes take in general, uh, I don't know what I would say to that. But she is an amusing figure, a thoughtful figure, and one I actually very much admire. And Faye Weldon is an author I just can't recommend enough to people. She's dark, and she presents aspects of the world and figures and characters that are the horribleness we sometimes want to hide from in social life, but she gives it to us there, and I really appreciate that. Continuing around, the medieval-looking image is related to Christine de Pizan's The City of Ladies, and this is a book not enough people know about. Uh, Christina Pazan wrote it after her husband had died and she was responsible for continuing the care of her children. Uh, she obviously had to live with a uh, male family member given the time period, and she was eventually able to earn enough from her writings that she was self-supporting. And that in and of itself is extraordinary, but in addition, The City of Ladies is, if you will, a sort of prototype for Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. In that she opens with the question, why is it that women cannot be considered thinkers or doers or great figures in history? And it's partly a response to Aquinas's The City of God, which is uh, not entirely lacking in misogyny. And it's also just a way of her sort of thinking through some of the troubling insights she was having as to the way women were being presented in books. And that also speaks to the way in which, in more contemporary times, people have talked about you know, the Smurfett syndrome and women in refrigerators vis-a-vis -vis the world of animation and how it uh, delimits women. 
So there's a long history here that has to do with my own study of feminism, um, gender studies and women's studies, and the marginalization of people and populations. And I think it's a really helpful fictional approach to a topic that we're all still trying to navigate. The next painting is one by Whistler, and it's really rather wonderful to me how this one comes to be. Whistler was an important artist for me in that he was one of the artists that I was really first started thinking on materiality, with his brush strokes and where they change over the years of his work that sort of made me enamored of thinking about art not only in terms of its content, but also its formal attributes and how those contribute to the type of meaning that we find in art. What I have since discovered is that uh, this particular painting is one that Carla did when she was a teenager. And I have since had the opportunity to see the painting that Carla did, and it's a really striking and beautiful uh, rendering of it. But I appreciate that both Carla and I was thinking through art in these different ways uh, at a similar moment in both our lives. The last artwork, per se, that I will address is Dali's hallucinogenic corridor. Um, it's here, and I still don't have words for everything about this painting. First of all, it's enormous. Um, it's one of his later works, and it's at the Dali Museum in Florida, where I was finally able to see it a few years ago. And it's really a masterwork. It brings out references from many of his earlier paintings, but it brings them together in an extraordinary way that, given its size, is really sort of hard to understand. Uh, when you see it in person, the way in which he's able to do these temporary effects is even more surprising and intriguing. It's probably the painting that made me realize that sometimes art would impact work and that maybe words wasn't always what was necessary in relationship to art, which is maybe why I have become interested in liminal spaces and the way in which sometimes it's the wordless things that we have to figure out in order to find new forms, new societies, new gatherings. And that kind of thing. Um, with all that, uh, there's this last skull here, and then, of course, there's this group of skulls. And on some level, of course, that is a nod to the sort of existentialism background of the absurd. But in a kind of absurdist twist, it's also speaking to my own love of nature. Um, I love to go for heights, and I have been... I'm lucky enough, I guess you could say, to find skulls, animal skulls, while I'm walking. Fortunately, never so far a human skull. Um, but I'm fascinated in anatomy and in the beauty of skeletons. Um, so I have several skulls and bones in my home that I don't find morbid, but that I find enduringly engaging and making you want to think about life and living and being alive. So that was obviously why we had that skulls in here. And then the la one of the last things I, I will mention is this podium. Um, podiums are so official and officious. I dislike speaking at podiums. And I thought it would be amusing to have one with no one standing at it except these skulls sort of jabbering on. And I really appreciate the way Carla uh, put those together for me. Uh, I, I hadn't imagined it that way, but that's exactly what I was imagining, if that can make sense. So it was really just like so much in this room, when I first walked into it, a kind of stunning revelation of 
seeing some part of my own mind made visual, these are all elements that have contributed to so much of what I think and to so much of uh, the, the internal world that I'm occupying. And so to see it made into a room like this is is really a window panel. Um, I will end by saying there's a number of things I'm not talking about. Uh, intentionally, the lava lab, the mud pits where we were standing and speaking for so long, the flies, so many of the cats. But I will, I will have us take a look at these curtains and the piano because it is such a brilliant and wonderful little scene. And that is precisely what it's like to have a thought is to peek out in the curtains and to think, maybe there's a thought here that I want to share with someone and to want to draw people in. And then maybe you're not so sure you want to draw people in after all. You're not quite sure what thought that is. Um, so it's just a perfect little, you know, mise en scène of what it's like to think and to write and to research and then to have to put it out there. And maybe some of the artists might feel that way, too. Lastly, the piano. How could there not be a piano? And how could there not be what is, to my mind, one of the best songs of all time? Peggy Lee's. Is that all there is? All there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my Let's keep